Hi, we are going to talk about effective nuclear charge. I am going to be honest with you, I am definitely not the expert on this. And even as I've read and studied on effective nuclear charge, my head can start to swim. So it's um, from my reading and studying and then working with students as well as um, looking at questions that I've come up with an approach. Um, an approach to figure out effective nuclear charge. Um, now, is all this going to be perfect when I say the power of the proton? No, it's not. Um, you could talk to a physical chemist and go, well, it's actually the relationship between the effect of the proton on the number of electrons and how many multi-electron, da, da, da. I want you to be able to figure out which has greater effective nuclear charge. So just know I'm not the expert and I'm trying to make this understandable for students. So here we go. Effective nuclear charge. Um, here's your overall trend. You're going to increase as you go from left to right and from bottom to top, meaning the lowest effective nuclear charge. As we look at our anchors, just a generalized trend of the periodic table, cesium is going to have the lowest and fluorine is going to have the highest effective nuclear charge. Now something to consider, this deals with valence electrons. When we talk about effective nuclear charge, and if you watched other videos of mine, sometimes I'll use ENC as the abbreviation. Don't use that on a test, okay? In your notes and to yourself, if you're writing fast, you can do ENC, but if you're writing on a test, use effective nuclear charge. Don't do ENC. Not, not every teacher or professor may use that. Um, let's see here. So if you see me talk about effective nuclear charge, we're dealing with valence electrons. Now everything other than the valence electrons, those are your core electrons, they shield the valence electrons from the full impact and power of the protons. Let me say that again. So you've got your nucleus and you have each consecutive energy level subshell is filled. Okay, off bell principle, they're all filled. And then you get that outermost energy level, the valence electrons. Um, and let's especially say it's not a full octet, okay? It's not a full octet. Well, those core electrons are going to shield that one outermost energy level, the valence electrons from the full power of the protons. Um, the outplay of this, the more protons you add as you go across the period, the greater their attraction um, their pull, the magnetism, if you will, think positive and negative, attracting, um, the greater the attraction between the electron and the proton. Uh, so a great application of this is going to be atomic radius. As I go across this period, I'm adding a proton every time. And remember, you have the core electrons, which are just going to be that 1s2, okay? And so as we're um, looking at our valence shell, second energy level, not only are we adding an electron, but we're adding a proton. And because you're adding a proton in comparison to that valence shell, those protons have a greater ability to attract the electrons to the nucleus. The result is the atoms get smaller. Because there's more protons, they attract, 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 attract with each new proton that's added as you're going across that period. Um, so I say it's the power of the proton. If you're comparing effective nuclear charge, whichever has the greatest number of protons as you're looking across the period is going to have the greatest effective nuclear charge. Now, and it's because the number of protons, power of the proton. Now, as you go up um, the periodic table, it's really going to be Coulomb's law. You're going to have a greater effective nuclear charge, a greater ability to attract electrons to the proton because the distance is smaller. So if I'm comparing effective nuclear charge between a chlorine and a bromine, the chlorine's valence shell is at 3p, whereas the bromine's valence shell is at the fourth energy level. Um, fourth energy level compared to third energy level. Smaller distance, greater energy, there's going to be greater effective nuclear charge. Um, so it's really the shell model um, and Coulomb's law right here um, that is going to show effective nuclear charge as you go up. As you go across, it's the power of that proton. You're going to, um, with every proton you add, you increase the attraction between those valence electrons and uh, the nucleus. So I hope that helps you, hope that, hope that helps. Effective nuclear charge is one of the ways um, that we can talk about and, and um, relay ionization energy. Um, your PES um, is going to be impacted by that as well. Um, and 
and um, Coulomb's law plays into all of this as well. So it's all, it all comes together in one really great big ball of helping us determine the atomic structure. Okay, oh, and just know, teachers and professors love the term effective nuclear charge. It is a buzzword that they love to see written. So when, you, um, when you're talking about trends and you can use effective nuclear charge, write that whole word out, you'll, you'll get good points. Have a good day, thanks.